archives of Prasar Bharti presents the timeless treasure of golden era. The crystal glitter of an enormous chandelier, grace and radiance perfectly matched like the power that reputedly strengthened the traditional courts of kings. We are in quest of royal courts. This is Kualia in the central Indian state of Madhya Pradesh. Kualia is an airport and railhead town. It is well served by road transport. Accommodation ranges from this top of the market palace where suites such as this cost 2,200 rupees and the gardens are fit for a king. More modest but very comfortable accommodation in the state-run hotel can be had for 490 rupees AC double. Gwalia bustles in the evening. This circle with a complex orchestration of the rhythm of life. We were caught up in the vitality of the town. Well, like the good citizens of Gwalia, we decided to sample its special confection. Gajak is a sweet. Crunchy, flaky, and delectable. The next morning we went up to the fort. Gwalia city spreads, massed and ancient from the base of the great flat top rock of Gwalia. Here, the Rani of Jansi was killed in battle while still mounted on her horse in 1858. But the fort is much older than 1858. This dry tank, the Suraj Kund, was once a spring near an ascetic cave. Then the Rajput chieftain Suraj Sen drank water from the spring. He was cured of a skin disease. Overjoyed, he named the hill Gwaliwa, a boon given by the ascetic Gwalipa. Gwalia Hill seems to attract saints and warriors. On the way up, we stopped to gaze at these beautiful Jain statues, carved out of the honey-colored rock. They date back many centuries, possibly to the time when Gwalia was ruled by the Toma kings. It was a Toma ruler, Raja Man Singh, who built the crowning glory of Gwalia, the Man Mandir Palace between 1486 and 1517. It is a magnificent structure, forbidding walls relieved by soaring towers and cupolas and glinting blue and yellow tiles of parrots, tigers, banana trees and ducks. The palace's wide courts admit light and air. Deep, wavy eaves throw cool shadows inside the rooms. The eaves have a curiously Chinese-Persian look and could reflect the Central Asian Mughal influence. The beautiful Jilmili stone screens, now an essential part of Gwalia's artistic heritage, have intricate designs which can be expressed in mathematical formulae. They are so exquisitely accurate. High ceilings, arches and ventilators make for naturally air-cooled interiors. All these are enlivened by festive grills of dancers. The palace takes on a fairy tale beauty during the nightly Sonia Lumiere, the sound and light show on the history of Gwalia Fort. It is both in English and Hindi. By the grace of God, will you look at that? 
It is unbelievable. Forts they are in Hindustan, but none like this. The combination of military might and beauty seems to be unique to India. This was the opinion of Dutch tourist James Daniel. We spoke to him the next morning in the Sas temple, also in the fort. He said, If you compare it to uh, the other fortresses we have seen uh, in other parts of the world, I think this is one of uh, the fortresses in India are one of the most uh, are the most beautiful fortresses we have ever seen so far. The Sas, or mother-in-law temple, where we met James, was, according to a plaque at the base of the temple, built by Mahipala, a Kachavaha prince of Gwalia, in 1093 AD. And there is the Bahu, or daughter-in-law temple. A famed architectural historian believes that these temples were designed by craftsmen from Gujarat because only they, with their skill in erecting columnar halls, could have conceived and built such daring structures. But quite apart from their architectural merits, the temples have a profusion of beautiful carvings. Also in the fort is the so called Telika Mandir. In spite of its name, it wasn't built by an oil merchant, but by a queen from the South Telangana, Andhra. In her nostalgia for familiar surroundings, she probably brought in an architect from home. He, in turn, made an interesting mixture of South Indian and Buddhist styles, adding another facet to the eclectic heritage of India. Not all our heritage has been so well conserved as the Telika Mandir and the Man Mandir. Within sight of Man Mandir is the Asi Khamba Bauri, the 80 pillared stepwell. In this walled and pillared hall, young brides once waited for their bridegroom. Cool air that blew through this forest of pillars would have been much cooler in the old days when the deep stepwell was filled with water. Water was also used effectively in Bejatal, in front of the present administrative offices. The central island appears to have been a stage for musicians and singers in the past. There are more ways to keep cool, however, than to drive down a green avenue. Hey, come back! We have brought something! The beautiful Jilmili's exclude the sunlight but let the breeze into the impressive tomb of Sheikh Muhammad Ghos. He lived in the 15th century and was a spiritual mentor, the guru of the famous singer of Akbar's court, Khan Sen. For 500 years, Muhammad Ghos's memory has been revered by people in Gwalior. Over these five centuries, some of the grills have been damaged, but they will be replaced as good as new, or rather, as good as the old. In the grounds of the tomb lives Prem Raj Mistry. He is 75 years old and has devoted his life to making such stone grills. In any other land, his craft would be called fossil skills. In our land, there are still living professions in which artisans use inherited techniques to work with the same tools, on the same materials, that went into our great masterpieces. Not far from Prem Raj Mistry's humble home and Mohammed Ghosh's mausoleum is the simple tomb of the great 16th century singer Tan Sen, one of the nine gems of the court of the great Mughal. There is a tamarinder tree growing near Tan Sen's tomb. Legend has it that anyone who chews a leaf of this tree will develop an impressive voice. We chewed the leaves and are still waiting, hopefully. It is said that Tan Sen developed his singing talents 
under a school of music which grew under the patronage of Man Singh and his Gujar queen, the doe-eyed Mriganayin. This independent queen lived in her own palace, the Gujari Mahal, at the base of Gwalia Hill. Today, its interconnected courts have been effectively used to display some of the exhibits of the state's archaeology department. The Gujari Mahal is now a museum. The more valuable exhibits, however, are in the halls and chambers, which once echoed the laughter and gossip of the ladies of Mriganaini's court. This Kashipatta depicts the river Ganga, alive with aquatic life flowing through Varanasi. Shiva and Parvati preside over this holy city. Also from Videsha and the 10th century is this Nataraj in the Buddhist style. Shiva and Vishnu combine to form Harihara, merging two streams of thought. Agni here epitomizes one aspect of grace. Sur Sundari is the epitome of Indian woman. The top of this pillar, this palm capital, shows a motif common to the architecture of Greece. It could have come from the Greek colonies which thrived in Syria between the 1st and 3rd century. This lion capital resembles our national emblem. Another lion capital has winged and beaked beasts which could show a cultural stream flowing in from Iraq, Egypt and Iran. Spot of this winged animal atop the chhatri dedicated to former Gwalia ruler G.R.G. Rao. Chhatris are memorials erected to dead rulers and their queens, and they are often superbly decorated and well worth discovering. Chhatris are usually set in extensive grounds, much as temples once were. this modern temple to the sun god Surya. Its grounds are green, cool and very popular with visitors. This temple was clearly inspired by the ancient sun temple in Urissa's Konarak. Surya was probably a bootshod deity from Iran, now enshrined in this green and valley. Cool lawns also embraced a mosque, temple, and gurdwara in the town's old pool bath. It's a popular place with the people of Gwalia of an evening. Next morning we had an encounter with a unique little train. It is the only one which chugs down the road in a major city in India. We 
we escaped from the crowded road train to the quiet, brilliantly white Jai Balas Palace. It has an Italianate design with Tuscan and Corinthian influences. One wing of it is devoted to the impressive Giagi Rao Sindhya Museum. This museum, run by a private trust, gives a good overview into the life and times of royal courts. A mailed warrior stands, his armor clearly influenced by Morel and Saracen fighters. On a gentler note, this crystal swing was used during the festivities of the birth of Lord Krishna, Janamaskami. Crystal furniture in a queen's boudoir still awes visitors. Even the rod of the hand-pulled punker fan is made of Belgian crystal. Rulers were expected to live like rulers. They had to drive in silver coaches, called the silver buggy in the museum. Maharajas were also expected to dine in such great halls, where a silver and crystal train chugged around the table, dispensing refreshments. A flight of regal stairs leads from the dining room to the magnificent gold and crystal drawing room above. Enormous chandeliers hang from the gilded panels of the ceiling. Legend has it that they made eight elephants stand on the roof to test if it was strong enough to hold these titanic celebrations of light. Even the panels are exquisite. It's a grand room for grand occasions. Those were other times with other pastimes. This enormous gun had to be mounted on the prow of a boat to decimate a cloud of wild duck. It was considered necessary for a gentleman to display hunting trophies. Most organized shoots were carried out in hunting reserves like Shifpuri, 112 road kilometers from Gwalior. Today, it is the Madhav National Park covering 156 square kilometers of forested hills, grassy plains, and water. In the middle of the jungle is George Castle. It was built for a single night's visit of King George V in 1911. But the king never came to Shivpuri. Though you are not likely to see any large animals in the park, you will see strangely fearless cheetah or spotted deer. We also saw Chinkara ambling away. They normally leap like startled schoolgirls. The Langus here acted rather as if they were out of work gangsters waiting for a leader. This little stream was alive with birds, including cattle aigrettes and purple herons. Also a moor hen and her chicks like a nun with a group of kindergarten children. We spotted these vultures, sitting black-robed and hunch-shouldered on a tree, as if waiting to be briefed. We headed towards them and found ourselves entering the double gates, typical of a safari park. And then we saw the superb animals 
meant for the park. Behind protective fences, tigers paced restlessly or lay with regal ease as if reclining in their own court. They were well fed and sleek, and every day the remains of their meal would be thrown under the vulture's tree, so nothing was wasted. The tigers had been withdrawn from the safari park till the fences of the park could be strengthened. After driving round the park, we relaxed in the brand of the boathouse, which is where the forest department has its office and where visitors pay their entrance fees. Only petrol vehicles are allowed in the park. There is a pleasant hotel in Shivpuri. It's run by the state and offers rooms like these at 490 rupees AC double. Dusk in Shivpuri should be reserved for a visit to the Sindhya Chhatris. The Chhatri at the entrance is made of off-white sandstone, intricately carved. It was built in 1919 in memory of Maharani Jija Maharaj, the mother of Madhu Rao Sindhya. Madhu Rao Sindhya's Chhatri faces that of his mother. It was completed in 1932 and has been crafted with all the exquisiteness of an inlaid ivory jewel box. Inside, a lifelike statue of Madhura Sindhya sits in all his regal finery, waiting for the court musicians to assemble and every evening they do. A court attendant in his ceremonial robes and turban takes post behind the musicians. Gradually, the atmosphere changes, it becomes charged. This is a command performance. This is an age of Maharajas and Maharanis. We have, in some strange emotional way, come to the end of our quest for royal courts. We are now ready to journey to the land where legends begin.